It was 1983. The nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union was approaching its peak year. Over 50,000 warheads were in play. Five times as many as today. And that spring. Our ultimate goal of eliminating the threat posed by strategic nuclear missiles. President Reagan announced the U.S. was working on a missile defense program known as Star Wars. And many feared this move would destabilize the standoff. And at this intense moment, the popular scientist Carl Sagan, host of the television show Cosmos, co-authored an article with four other scientists on nuclear winter, published in the journal Science. And Sagan rushed to share their findings with the press. According to the theory of nuclear winter, nuclear weapons won't just kill the people who are in harm's way of the blasts and the people who get sick from radioactive fallout. Nuclear weapons could kill, potentially, all people, wipe out the human race. Because the explosions and the resulting fires would propel enough smoke and ash into the atmosphere to block out the sun, causing cold temperatures, crop failures, and mass starvation. I discussed nuclear winter in a documentary I made where I showed this graphic. It depicts that up to 70% of the sun could be blocked in the Northern Hemisphere. And I said that scientists believe nuclear winter could last months, even years. And I believed it. I believed in nuclear winter from as far back as I can remember. I saw movies as a teenager, like threads that horrified me and certainly influenced my work. Now, I wasn't alone in believing this, of course. The idea that the bomb gave us the power to bring about our own extinction seems pretty widely accepted. Part of our culture, our identity. Which is why it's been a bit disorienting for me to learn that the theory is, while some say it's evolved since 1983, and some argue that the threat was overstated from the beginning. And I've been thinking about it because, honestly, I resisted digging into it after learning the theory was suspect to fact check my movie because I wanted people to believe in nuclear winter, perhaps for a similar reason that Carl Sagan was so eager to spread the word. If nuclear explosions will transform the Earth into a dark, cold, uninhabitable place, everyone really loses. The game is all the more unwinnable and all the more foolish to play. And that's why there's a part of me that doesn't want to do what I'm about to do here, but here we go. Let's start by talking about the difference between gases like CO2 that can stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years and aerosols that settle more quickly. Aerosols are tiny particles, both natural and industrial. They include sea salt that blows off oceans, mineral dust that blows off deserts, ash and soot from fires, all sorts of pollutants. They range in size and weight. Now, often you can't see them. Often you can when they're dense, like with smoke, and they can absolutely block the sun. Now, eventually, aerosols settle to the surface because gravity pulls them down. Other forces can send them upwards temporarily. They get pushed up originally by wind or when the air around them is heated, which makes it rise. Aerosols tend to stay in the atmosphere for about 10 days, but certain particles can go higher and hang longer. One big factor is rain, which carries aerosols down to the surface. Nuclear bombs produce a lot of heat, which propels smoke and ash way up into the air, creating that tall column and mushroom cloud we know so well. Nuclear bombs also create fires that can spread potentially far from the blast zone. And all this fire will produce smoke and ash, blocking the sun in many places. The question is, how long will the aerosols hang in the air before settling, and how serious will the impact be? We know from volcanic eruptions and asteroids that aerosols can have long-term serious consequences on the climate. But nuclear explosions are different in some important ways. Mount Pinatubo in 1991 was the biggest eruption of the century in terms of climate impact. It was a monster. And it was recent enough that we have some good data. Volcanoes often spew out gases, notably sulfur dioxide, 
And Mount Pinatubo injected 15 million tons of it into the atmosphere, which rose all the way up to the stratosphere where it turned into sulfate aerosols. The stratosphere is above where rain falls, which means aerosols can last much longer. Note that the larger ash aerosols, for the most part, settled. And we can actually see how sulfate aerosols spread around the globe using special satellite imagery. And here's what this did to the Earth's average surface temperature. It dropped as much as 0.3 degrees Celsius, and it lasted years. Now, the dinosaur-killing asteroid is believed to have blocked the sun for a prolonged time. But this event is so, so different from a nuclear explosion. Nuclear bombs are powerful and all, but the destructive force of this impact is estimated to be 100 billion times larger. 100 billion atomic bombs. The chain of events that followed this impact are so utterly horrifying and uncanny. Kurzgesagt made an amazing video of this, and they've allowed us to show some clips. We're talking earthquakes across the globe of a magnitude unlike anything we've ever seen. Tidal waves submerging half the US. Lava spewing out of the fractured Earth's crust. And vaporized rock erupting from the blast zone, spreading around the Earth in space, and then raining down globally causing the entire Earth to get as hot as an industrial oven, killing most dinosaurs within hours. The point is, nuclear explosions are really different from big asteroids. And since they don't emit sulfur dioxide the way volcanoes do, for nuclear explosions to cool the Earth in a significant way, the smoke and ash they produce has to rise way up into the stratosphere above the rainfall. And for that to happen, the nuclear winter theory points to this plume lofting effect where the sun heats the smoke particles, causing the air around it to warm and then rise. Now, smoke doesn't generally do this, right? It settles. But there is evidence that lofting happens in certain situations, like intense firestorms. A 2017 forest fire in Canada caused smoke to get into the stratosphere, and some aerosols stayed up there as long as eight months. It doesn't seem to have had a significant climate impact, but it serves as a proof of concept. The thing is, if you're going to talk about evidence that supports the nuclear winter theory, you should also talk about evidence that doesn't. For starters, we have actual nuclear attacks. In 1945, the US dropped two nuclear weapons on cities in Japan. The smoke generated from the attack settled pretty quickly. In Hiroshima, the smoke seeded rain clouds and black rain fell a few hours later. Now bombs are bigger now and cities are bigger too, which means there's more burnable material resulting in more smoke. But keep in mind, in nuclear war, most atomic bombs will be detonated high above the ground to maximize their radius of destruction. Some will target underground missile silos and bunkers, which could jettison more dust into the air. But those are the exceptions, not the rule. That's why, according to the nuclear winter theory, much of the smoke would come from fires that spread on the surface after the original detonation. And it so happens, we've learned a lot about big fires recently. Now let's look at the area that was burned from the Hiroshima attack and then size this up to the area burned in the recent megafire in Australia. Forest fires are arguably much more relevant events to study than volcanoes. The visible sun-blocking smoke from these big fires was far-reaching and quite unworldly, but it settled in a matter of days. Now, some aerosols remain in the air longer, perhaps that plume effect was in play. The National Center for Atmospheric Research found that the global cooling effect for the Australia fires was at the most severe moment 0 0.06 degrees Celsius. Now let's compare this cooling to the cooling of Mount Pinatubo. Looking at this suggests to me that big volcanoes with their sulfur dioxide are more effective at getting aerosols into the stratosphere and cooling the earth than surface fires. How much worse would nuclear war fires have to be compared to the Australia fires to cause as much cooling as Mount Pinatubo? And how much fire would it take for agriculture to fail? civilizations to collapse, humans to go extinct. Smoke from city fires could be darker than forest fires due to burning plastic, which some say could increase the likelihood of plumes rising high and blocking the sun. And that brings us to the Kuwait fires of 1991. When Saddam Hussein burned the oil fields, Carl Sagan warned that the massive oil fires could bring about wintry conditions, and it didn't happen. The smoke dispersed, and settled. No measurable cooling effect. So look, I don't know the answers to these questions, and hopefully we'll never know for sure. 
In my film, I took a guess at what portion of the population would die from a full-out nuclear war, even without counting for a nuclear winter. We're talking eight World War II's worth. Terrible beyond imagination. I'm personally so frightened of nuclear war that I've devoted years to making movies about it. And even after coming to question the nuclear winter theory, I'm still horrified by the bomb. It's still a game where both sides lose. The thing I'm reflecting on here is that after learning that I may have overstated the nuclear winter threat, I didn't feel motivated to set the record straight. Like, what's the benefit of pursuing truth in a case like this, when the takeaway is confusing? Is the truth reason enough? And that brings us to how this video came to be and the concept of truth decay, which is probably not a term you've heard before. The Rand Corporation reached out to me to help start a larger conversation about it. They are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that has been researching a phenomenon they've identified as truth decay, which refers to the diminishing role of facts in American public life. It was important to Rand and me that the ideas I express here are my own. In fact, the nuclear winter theory I just discussed would likely not fall under their definition of truth decay. Nuclear winter was debated by scientists, and the theory has evolved over time. Instead, truth decay refers to disagreements over more basic facts, which Rand argues isn't new, but has really taken hold of the U.S. over the past two decades, eroding civil discourse, causing political paralysis, and leading to public uncertainty and disengagement. The line between opinion and fact is growing blurrier, and the opinions are growing louder. There's a declining trust in formerly respected sources of facts. What I want to talk about in this video that I feel is key to understanding this topic is that people who hold false beliefs have reasons to do so. Maybe it's just because they've been misinformed by others, say through social media. Maybe the reasons are more complicated. There is a tendency for us to point to people in other social groups as the problem, as the source of truth decay. And I don't think that's working so well. If looking outward is all we do, we'll never get anywhere. But looking inward and assessing whether we, as individuals or a group, are believing in mistruths ourselves can be hard to do. So I'm trying to do that in this video. I'll be talking about cases where I realized I was perhaps wrong about something, and I'll try to set the record straight. Though most of my films have been about war, my last one was on climate change. And since launching it, I've been talking to people who've seen the film and still don't believe that humans are causing global warming, who will simply call climate skeptics here. I did a Zoom call with a group of them, and I'll say they were really respectful. They clearly wanted to be heard and to make their case. And the points they made spanned a broad spectrum. On one end, they said things I don't think are reasonable. For example, I'm surprised by how many don't believe this temperature history. The one I showed here, that's based on thermometer data or weather stations and computed by NASA. They tell me the numbers are miscalculated, manipulated, or just plain made up. A few said that the weather stations themselves are not reliable for reasons involving the boxes that hold the thermometers. And I've actually been working on a video to explore how this average temperature line is produced, which, believe it or not, gets really interesting. On the other side of the spectrum, they have made arguments that I thought were reasonable. They made criticisms of my movie that I couldn't defend so easily. At the end of my video, I showed what I called a defeatist view of our future, where major cities and most of Florida became submerged by rising seas. They said the evidence doesn't support so much sea rise, and I admit the data does get a bit shaky there. And speaking of worst case scenarios, I should correct a clear error I made at this moment in my video. I showed this IPCC projection saying it assumes humans do nothing to change their behavior. Actually, we've made some real progress since the future looked this bad. A projection based on current policies looks like this. Our pledged policies looks even better. And the funny thing is, my movie, which I admit portrayed some things to be worse than they really are in places, is pretty tame compared to a lot of the discourse. It's not uncommon for authors, YouTubers, activists, and college professors to say that we're facing the end of civilization or even extinction by 2100, since ecosystems and food systems could collapse. Climate skeptics find predictions like this outrageous. What do climatologists say? Well, the latest IPCC report talks about humanitarian consequences, severe weather, rising seas, droughts, loss of agriculture, devastating stuff, but nothing close to human extinction or the end of human civilization. 
In fact, many climatologists make a point to refute the idea that we're going to cross a threshold or a tipping point where everything unravels. I use the phrase runaway temperature in my movie, and I used to think that thawing permafrost could result in a perpetual warming loop. The IPCC report explicitly refutes that. Yes, the sooner we act, the better, absolutely. But we're not about to trigger a doom spiral that will make the planet uninhabitable. So notice a the theme here. In my climate and nuclear war movies, it's the end of the world, the worst case scenarios, where I may have gone too far and misinformed the viewers. And in both cases, I'm left wondering about, well, truth. Climate change and nuclear war are both really bad. So does it really matter if we overstate the dangers a bit? Doing so might energize people to act and prevent a catastrophe. Besides, it is possible, even if very improbable, that the worst cases do occur. The thing is, people like me talk about facts and science a lot. We accuse climate skeptics of disregarding evidence when it's inconvenient. And believe me, the skeptics I've been talking to notice when I, or these institutions we keep urging people to trust, seem willing to stray from the evidence when it comes to what they call fear-mongering. My last gloomy example involves the pandemic. The New York Times commissioned a survey to ask Americans what they think about COVID. It was taken during the Omicron wave. And the results were pretty striking. Now, I'm somebody who got vaccinated and vaccinated my children. And like many, I look at how many unvaccinated people have died and see it as a tragic, avoidable loss of life. The U.S. is less vaccinated than other rich countries where vaccines are widely available, and we've died in greater numbers as a result. Now, it wasn't surprising that the Times survey found that Americans' views are quite polarized by party affiliation. But I was surprised, and so are the reporters, about some of the views held by those in the pro-vaccine camp. Many who were vaccinated, young, and boosted still didn't feel protected. People didn't feel their children were safe. In my climate documentary, I argue that it's often hard to explain uncertainty or risk with words or even numbers. Often, you have to step back and size up things against each other. So technically, yes, there are risks that come with getting the vaccine, but those risks only have meaning if you compare them to the risks of not getting the vaccine. A recent study found that the COVID death rate among the unvaccinated is 48 times higher than the vaccinated. Similarly, we need to size up the risk of catching COVID against other dangers, which is particularly interesting in the case of children. Here we see how many children died from COVID over the course of nine months in the U.S. in 2021. Now let's compare that to how many were killed by other dangers during that same period. Notice COVID is in the same category as the flu, but it's significantly less likely to kill your child than driving cars, guns, or even drowning. Parents, myself included, decide every day it's worth the risk to drive our children to school or to friends' houses. But during the pandemic, we've canceled playdates and sometimes supported keeping kids home from school. Now, I understand the infectious aspect of COVID makes the risk calculation more complicated. Children can spread the disease. But speaking for myself and my friends and family, I think this fear we've developed for our children went beyond them becoming vectors. We talk about politics skewing opinions all the time, and surveys like this plainly show this troubling reality. But it's another thing to admit when our own beliefs are distorted because of politics. So let me take a whack at that. I acknowledge that some of my feelings about kids and COVID were partly a political reaction. It upset me to see people refuse life-saving measures like vaccines, so being COVID cautious became part of my political identity. I disproportionately focused on COVID risks over more important concerns for our kids. There, you know, it wasn't so bad. So to wrap this video up, nuclear war, climate change, and COVID are all very serious, all carry enormous potential for human suffering, but the risks can be overstated. Now, understating a risk is so clearly dangerous and wrong, since disregarding a threat can result in terrible consequences. Overstating a risk doesn't seem as bad, since we're arguably better safe than sorry, and let's be honest, scaring people a bit may produce positive results. But I do want to identify a few problems with doing that. One, it makes it harder for us to figure out what to do. With any problem, there's always some degree of measure when deciding how drastically we should act. 
When the debate becomes polarized between deniers and doomers, it's hard to find common ground or take action. Two, overstatements can backfire if they cause you to lose credibility. I've seen skeptics time and again point to overstatements to discredit valid warnings. And lastly, there's the more philosophical question about the truth. We often hear those who promote preventative action, myself included, proclaim that we have to confront the truth, the science, no matter how inconvenient. But if you only get upset about untruths that fall on one side of the risk equation, you can slip into making a moral argument and less of a factual one. So clearly I feel when it comes to battling truth decay, we can make progress by reflecting on our own biases and being honest about mistakes. Though you may say there's a bit more to it than that. And Rand is working to understand the problems in a comprehensive way and to develop systemic solutions. They advocate that policymakers, tech companies, the media, and educators need to get on board. I'm grateful for them for supporting this video and for the important work they do. So while the credits roll, I'd like to share a few of the recommendations they offer to help all of us do our part in tackling truth decay. Consider and question your own bias and the bias of the source when you're reading or watching something. Some media outlets are more skewed than others, and we tend to gravitate towards places where our own biases are confirmed. Truth is usually pretty nuanced. Overly simplified explanations are often one-sided or just plain wrong. Most issues don't have an easy answer. Produce and share information responsibly. If you do make a mistake and share something false or from a dodgy source, be honest and correct it. And if you see your friends and family consume or share information that is false, try to speak up respectfully without shaming or fighting. And finally, try to get offline and have conversations with people that may help you develop a better understanding of different perspectives. If we all keep an open mind, who knows, we may find areas where we can cooperate. Thanks for watching. Feel free to check out some of the resources below to learn more and see you next time.